It's time to announce the second presenter, who is Michael Collins from, let me say, our side of the Atlantic Ocean. So, kindly welcome. And I see you accept our invitation. So, Michael Collins is the president of the famous company, CM, uh, which, uh, let me say, fabricate very unique equipment, uh, which is involved in microwaves synthesis. Uh, uh, it is very, very important for the material science. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and first of all, I want to say it's a great pleasure to be invited to give a presentation here, and I want to thank the uh, Polish Chemical Society for doing that. When I was uh, thinking about the presentation, I, I thought what I would do today is give you the story of microwave technology and how it got started and the impact it's had in the world of chemistry, but uh, very importantly, talk about the future and where we think microwave will go in the future, because we still believe it's a very new technology in a lot of ways and has a lot of new applications for the future. Uh, before I do that, I want to recognize, a, obviously, a famous scientist from Poland. And in preparing for this presentation, I, I did some background reading and uh, absolutely was amazed at uh, what this lady accomplished early when uh, women were not involved in science to a great extent. And uh, she was a uh, obviously a successful scientist, physicist, and chemist. Uh, she discovered uh, two elements, polonium, polonium and radium, um, and also uh, was the first person to win two Nobel Prizes, uh, and also two in two different disciplines, one in chemistry and one in physics, and uh, just had an amazing career, and then very importantly established uh, an institute in Paris and also uh, here in Warsaw, and I'm going to have the honor of touring her museum later today, so I really look forward to that, to that opportunity. Um, let me start out with a quote that I like. Um, uh, any new technology or new ideas uh, do change things. And I think microwave technology would fall into that category if you look at the impact that it's had on the world of chemistry. Uh, and things aren't the same when you, when you really bring a new technology to the market. Um, microwaves were made possible by the development of uh, the microwave oven and the magnetrons that powered those. And the inventor of that, many of you may or may not know, was a person called Percy Spencer, who was actually a radar, uh, did radar work uh, on ships in the Navy. And the story goes, one day he had a, a chocolate bar sitting beside his, his radar equipment, and the chocolate bar melted. It, it clearly was heated by the microwave. This gave him the idea of creating a microwave oven to cook food and to do things with food. Uh, the first microwave oven in today's world would cost $55,000. So there was obviously at the beginning uh, very expensive technology and it wasn't a practical device. Later, very importantly, um, one of the most important things was the magnetron was developed, an air-cooled magnetron that was uh, relatively inexpensive. And that's what made possible the uh, development of microwave ovens for consumer product. And there, those were first, first commercialized microwave ovens, came to market in the early 1970s, and really it was all based, again, on the fact that there, there was a high-volume, uh, mass-produced magnetron that would allow you to produce up to 1,000 or 1,500 watts of microwave power, and it was air-cooled. And that's really what made the whole, the whole world of microwave uh, is available for the consumer product and ultimately for the laboratory market. This is an interesting... Uh, case where the technology went to the consumer market first uh, and then we came up with the idea later of applying that into the laboratory marketplace because generally it goes the other way. Generally you have new developments in the laboratory and they wind up eventually uh, turning into consumer products in certain cases. Uh, if we look at microwaves, obviously it's, it's electromagnetic radiation uh, with an electric field and a magnetic field. All of the chemistry that we do and the chemical applications we apply generally relate to the electric field and the transfer of energy from that electric field into the molecular species or the systems that we're applying energy to. Uh, it turns out the frequency that's used in microwave is 2450 megahertz. That's one of four frequencies that are available for commercial use. They're called ISM frequencies, industrial, scientific, and medical applications. Uh, this is this is the uh, second highest frequency. Um, and this turns out to be ideal 
for doing chemistry because the absorption uh, characteristics of it and also the penetration of it make it a very ideal frequency for doing microwave chemistry. Uh, and it has, it's really what's pretty exclusively used right now. Uh, in the future, there may be opportunities to look at the higher frequencies that are available. They would have less penetration but more energy transfer or the lower frequencies which would have higher penetration but, but less energy transfer. Uh, if you look at microwave heating, and I think most of you probably know this, conventionally in a laboratory, if you look at what was done and what still is done, you do, convention, you do conductive heating. You have hot plates, you have things that conduct uh, heat based on a temperature uh, gradient. But the, it's a slow process. It typically has to heat through a container if you're trying to heat things that are inside the container. It's also not very controllable. Uh, you can't turn it off instantly uh, when you're done with the, with the energy you want to apply. Microwave is totally different in that it directly couples with species that are present. In, many, in most cases, the container that's, that are being used, things like glass and plastics, uh, are transparent to microwaves. So the microwave will go in and directly heat uh, species based on their polarity. So it gives you a, a totally different way of applying energy to systems and to doing chemistry and this is uh, can be quite important and it's what got us interested in pursuing microwave as a as a new tool to be used in the laboratory uh, there's two mechanisms for microwave um, that are well known first you have dipole rotation where if you have a, any kind of a polar species uh, any kind of a molecule that's got a dipole moment uh, and the stronger the dipole moment the stronger the interaction it will try to track this rapidly alternating electric field which will cause kinetic energy transfer into the molecular, the polar species that are directly coupling with the microwave uh, and then that will result in an energy transfer. The other is ionic conduction where if you have ions present uh, they're going again to try to track the rapidly alternating electric field and you will get uh, kinetic energy transferred into the system. Uh, kinetic energy, um, as temperature increases in the system, the coupling with the microwave actually increases. So that is a very effective way to get energy into the system. The dipole rotation, typically as temperature increases, the microwave interaction will decrease. Uh, in most of the systems that are done in, um, in the chemistry world, you have typically sometimes a strongly ionic solution, sometimes a a dipole sometimes both, but it really depends on the species that are present, uh, what kind of energy transfer you will achieve. Um, we started CEM back in 1978 um, recognizing that, that, uh, that microwave was available. Magnetrons were available at that time to produce um, energy that was required and so it created an opportunity. I was a physical chemist, did my PhD in physical chemistry in microwave spectroscopy. So I had an interest in microwave and saw a great future for it in the chemistry world and applying it to various applications. So we started and our first application was actually to use it for drying, for doing uh, loss on drying, gravimetric tests where you could use microwave energy to couple <coughs> with water or other polar species that were present and get rapid drying of the system. And this was a very successful initial product for the company and this is the uh, now the sixth generation of that product and uh, it's used around the world for in, in laboratories and in production situations and the latest development in this technology is we, we now have a uh, dual source where we use infrared and microwave uh, energy uh, in, in conjunction with each other to be able to remove bound water and polar water so the technology has developed dramatically and, and is now being applied in many laboratories where you want to do uh, loss where you want to remove volatiles or do a loss on drying. Uh, then in 1985, about uh, seven years later, uh, a very important application emerged for microwave and that was microwave digestion. Prior to that, sample preparation for doing elemental analysis uh, used open beakers on hot plates uh, with concentrated acid either nitric, um, aqua regia, or the, the various strong acids. Uh, the process were, were slow and very um, uh, hazardous because you have fumes coming out. Uh, typically it would be six or eight hours, and in many cases it was difficult 
to get full destruction of the samples. Uh, around that time, um, the inductively coupled instruments became available, ICP and ICPMS. So there was a real uh, need for faster and better sample preparation to, uh, for those types of instruments. And microwave turned out to be the ideal solution. Acids, as you know, are very polar. So you get a very strong interaction between the acid, particularly a strong acid, and the microwave fields. So, that, uh, so the heating of the acids was very efficient using microwave. Uh, the technology evolved uh, dramatically. The initial microwave systems didn't have any controls. You had closed vessels in a microwave with no temperature or pressure control. Uh, that quickly evolved into temperature and pressure controls in the microwave, which were challenging because you had strong acids and you had a, uh, situations where it took some, some very good technology development to achieve those kinds of things. And you can't use traditional thermocouples in a microwave because they will interact with the field and you'll get in inaccurate readings. So fiber optic probes and uh, some more sophisticated technology was used to, uh, to do the temperature measurements. Also the vessel technology um, uh, developed uh, rapidly, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide, to vent and reseal technologies that allowed people to go to higher pressures, higher temperatures, uh, and be able to do the more difficult applications. Uh, if you look at the challenge that you have when you do microwave digestion is you, first of all, you typically cannot use metal in a microwave and also with the strong acids, you're going to have corrosion issues. So you've got to use polymer, polymeric materials, uh, which tend to, um, to, to not have strength, particularly as you elevate the temperature. You also need a material that's chemically inert to strong acids at very high temperatures, temperatures approaching uh, 270, 280 degrees. Uh, the only materials that will really allow you to do that are either Teflon or quartz material, or in some cases Pyrex glass, depending on the, uh, the analytes that you're looking for. So you really, the initial microwave work used the Teflon vessels uh, the challenge with Teflon, though, is it's not, it's chemically very inert, but structurally it's, it's a very weak material. So vessels had to be designed so the wetted surfaces were Teflon, but they were reinforced with other polymeric materials to be able to withstand the forces that were generated. And there are these things like these composite sleeves that are shown here. Uh, these vessels also have to be uh, simple, light, easy to use. Uh, for the operators, so there were a lot of requirements, and a lot of the technology was, that was developed uh, was in the development of the vessels themselves. Um, and this shows you um, one of the vessels that shows you the reinforcement of the vessel, where you have the, um, the material inside the vessel in a Teflon uh, container, can, and then with composite sleeves on the outside, and, and other polymeric material to hold it together. Uh, this, this gives you finally on the digestion field the applications and how they developed. Uh, initially, uh, microwave was running at operating up to about 175 degrees. Uh, these conditions work well for environmental samples, tissue type samples, and that's where it was applied in the initial stages. Uh, more difficult applications emerged later. Uh, food became a very important area and food can be a fairly difficult matrix depending on its composition, particularly if it has a high lipid content. Um, so the technology developed where you're able to run at higher pressures and temperatures up to 220 degrees, uh, and that really expanded the use of the microwave. Uh, then more recently, uh, pharmaceuticals has become a very important area. There's new regulations uh, just in the last several years that now require uh, pharmaceutical products to be tested for the heavy metals uh, and that requires sample preparation. And some of those uh, applications can be fairly difficult. Some of the APIs uh, have, have um, um, complex structures that, that require high temperatures to fully digest. So pharmaceuticals have become a newer application that in many cases can require higher temperature. And now finally, uh, this in the last two years, uh, the microwaves have gotten to where we can get up to 280 degrees with simple systems that go inside the microwave 
and operate at pressures up to 2,000 PSI, which is equivalent to over 100 bar of pressure. So I think you can see what's happened over the, over the period where microwaves have been present. The technology has continued to develop and allow you to do these new applications. Um, with this, uh, now we're on our seventh generation of microwave technology with the things that have been done. Uh, there's, um, there's over 25,000 systems that have been sold during that period. I would say almost any laboratory doing elemental analysis uh, would be using microwave digestion. It's truly become the standard for uh, all different types of laboratories and I think will continue to be an important, play an important role. Uh, one of the new developments in the microwave uh, is the uh, a disposable glass tube that actually operates in the, um, can be used in the Teflon vessel to provide a disposable, to reduce the cleaning required for Teflon vessels. Because when you're operating at these extremely high temperatures and pressures, uh, you can impregnate uh, contaminants in the Teflon vessel, and uh, that can require extensive cleaning of the vessels for doing different applications. So this is a new development where the, I think the video is not working here, but um, this new vessel actually, uh, you're like, you can put that in a Teflon vessel and it's pressurized externally with a small amount of hydrogen peroxide, which is on the outside of the vessel. That then allows you to use that to do the digestion at the high pressure and temperature conditions, uh, and then it can be disposed of. It's an inexpensive tube, and it's just been introduced in the last year, uh, and, and it's uh, creating a lot of interest, uh, particularly for laboratories doing lots of samples, uh, unknown samples, where they're not sure about the purity of the samples. Now, if you look at where, where microwaves are used now, uh, there's over 100,000 systems worldwide for all of these different kinds of applications, environmental testing, food, food testing, pharmaceuticals, um, nanomaterials, so any, almost any aspect of analytical chemistry now that's involved in atomic spectroscopy or elemental analysis will be using uh, or is using microwave digestion and it has allowed applications that could never be done before. Um, in 2002, another revolution occurred. Microwave synthesis came on the scene, and there had been earlier work done with microwave, but commercial products became available for using microwave to do uh, synthetic chemistry. And, and this um, created a, a lot of excitement, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, the medicinal chemistry for doing um, uh, drug development and also in the universities for doing organic chemistry. And this gives you an idea of the, um, the uh, extent to which microwave technology has been adopted. Uh, this is um, publication progressions. There's now over 50,000 publications where microwave has been, is, has been uh, cited. Uh, there's, there, early on, there was a lot of work done with microwave to, to explore its possibilities. Uh, but it's now being routinely used in, in most synthetic chemistry labs for doing um, chemical synthesis, organic synthesis in particular where it started. Uh, also material science now, nanomaterials um, are a very exciting area for microwave because of the selective nature and some of the unique effects you can get from microwave. Um, to start with, when microwave was first applied to synthetic chemistry, there was a lot of discussion about what was the mechanism. How did microwaves speed up chemical reactions? Because it was found, amazingly, people would have a chemical reaction that might take two or three hours, and suddenly with a microwave, they could do it in five or 10 minutes. Uh, they had some reactions where they could get no product, but with microwave, they could get a significant product in a very short period of time. So there was a lot of speculation as to what was going on with microwave, and I think we now understand well what the mechanisms are. If you look at the uh, Arrhenius equation, the rate constants, uh, you've got the pre-exponential factor, which is the, um, the orientation of the molecules to cause the reaction to occur. If we look at that, there was some speculation initially that microwaves might affect that, but I think uh, that's been more or less disproven. The microwave really doesn't affect uh, that that uh, component of the Arrhenius equation. 
Um, there was also some speculation that the activation energy might be affected by the microwave because of the polarity of the electric field and it might have some effect there. But I think generally that's been shown not to be the case. So microwave, uh, what it really does is it affects the temperature uh, component in the Arrhenius equation uh, in the same way that other types of energy going into the system. But because you can have selective heating, what happens is you may have temperature, different instantaneous temperatures from different components that then result in an overall bulk temperature. So I think it's pretty well understood now what microwave does, and this has helped in applying microwave and, and really understanding the basic mechanisms. Um, and what happens if you have a polar species present, it's going to absorb the microwave, and then that's going to radiate and create bulk heating of the sample as, it, um, as that energy dissipates from the absorbing species. Uh, you've got a couple of different possibilities with microwave, and I want to just show you some of these. Uh, first of all, you could have a situation where you've got a uh, polar solvent, solvent that's very polar, and you have reactants that may have uh, large dipoles or moderate dipoles, or you could even have ionic species present. In this, in this kind of a situation, generally the microwave energy, when it's applied, is going to heat the solvent because you have so much more solvent present than you do the reacting species, depending on the concentration of the solution. So for these kinds of chemistries, uh, what, you're, what you'll basically get is bulk heating. You'll be able to, the, you'll get a, it's a very rapid, efficient way to achieve bulk heating. So you can get faster chemistries, easier chemistries, but basically you're just very efficiently heating the solvent and causing the reaction to occur in, in the normal fashion. Uh, you can have a different situation where you use a nonpolar solvent, where the solvent is, say, benzene or, um, or a hexane or a solvent that is nonpolar. Um, and you, in that case, you can have reactants, uh, reactants with either small dipoles or large dipoles or ionic species present. In these kind of um, systems, when the microwave energy is applied, it's going to selectively be uh, react with the the more polar species, the large dipoles, the ionic species, and that's where you can get some very unique microwave effects because you're not heating bulk heating the solvent as you do with with uh, conventional conductive heating, um, and this this can uh, again result in some very interesting uh, chemistries, and it's been exploited uh, in a number of publications. Uh, once people understood the differences here, you can actually design your chemistry system to exploit this, uh, this selective heating and, and take advantage of it with the microwave. Uh, give you a couple of examples here. This was a, it's a palladium catalyzed fluorination of a CH bond and this is a, a fairly important reaction for um, uh, drug discovery and uh, a lot of the, um, the molecules they want to explore, fluorine can be an important addition to that in, in terms of it, some of the biological activities that it can affect. Uh, so this was some work done by um, um, uh, Dr. Sanford at the University of Michigan, some really nice work. And in this case, um, you have a, uh, basically a nonpolar solvent. You've got benzene that you're refluxing at 110 degrees, so it's nonpolar. It's not going to absorb the microwave. When she did that conventionally, she took 18 hours to do the reaction, uh, and she got uh, a fairly low yield of the desired component A that she wanted to fluorinate at the uh, at the uh, that hydrogen spot and she did not want the cross coupling uh, B and C uh, compounds. Uh, when you did it with microwave the reaction was done in one hour with 97 percent overall yield but very importantly 75 percent of the desired component A uh, that, that was present. Reason being for that is if you look at the um, the fluorine source, it's, it's a salt, it's very ionic, so it's going to couple strongly with the microwave and be energized. Uh, you've also got uh, the, um, the, the 8-methyl quinoline, which is also fairly polar and will, will absorb, will couple with the microwave as, as well as your, uh, your catalyst, your palladium catalyst. So that's what's driving the chemistry here because it's being energized by the microwave where the benzene, the nonpolar solvent, is, is 
acts more like a heat sink and is not directly being heated by the microwave. Another example, just to show this effect, is um, worked on a, on a zincation where they wanted to do a methylation of, of this compound. And uh, in this case, without microwave running, trying to run this reaction, they got no yield. Um, with microwave, um, at 120 degrees in five hours, you got a 90% yield. Uh, and again, the reason being here, you're using THF, which is a relatively nonpolar solvent, so the solvent's not participating in the reaction or in the heating, the microwave uh, transfer of heat. But you've got the, the zinc ion and some other ionic species here that are strongly interacting and are activated and then cause the chemistry to go. So again, this, this is another example where microwave can totally change the chemistry in some very important ways. Once you understand this, then you can design chemistries to take advantage of this effect. And that's what, what has happened. And, and you see that in a lot of the later publications that have come out in the last five or 10 years. And then finally, a, a, a big area for microwave now is in nanomaterials and uh, forming crystals where you get a direct activation of the, of the metal ions themselves. Uh, they will interact quite strongly. That promotes the nucleation and then the propagation uh, in, in a very nice way and also will lead to more monodispersed colloids uh, and give you a better quality at the end of the chemistry. And an example of this is a, um, producing uh, silver nanoparticles. The traditional way to do this is you have to use very strong base material at a very high temperature. Typically, you're at 300 degrees. It's a difficult. And the, uh, the final product, the dispersion, is not, not as good as people would like. Um, this is an example where using microwave, they used a very simple silver nitrate with lysine arginine as the mild base materials to use with that at 100 degrees, uh, but amazingly for 10 seconds. So this reaction was done in 10 seconds because the microwave is strongly interacting uh, with the silver ions because you've got an ionic metal species in there that is selectively interacting with the microwave and can drive this chemistry uh, in, in amazing, so you're talking two to three orders faster reaction time with this. Um, but very importantly too, the quality of what you get. You get, a, you get a very nice smaller particles and more uniform particle size and that's what people are really looking for uh, when they're doing the, this nanomaterial research. So this is a, a big field for microwave and it's one that's growing and being used more and more and, and really offers some great possibilities in the future. Um, let me finish now by talking about some of the biopharma applications for microwave. Um, uh, Merrifield, uh, obviously, I think all of you probably know him, was the inventor of the solid phase uh, peptide synthesis, uh, and, and it really became the basis for combinatorial chemistry. Uh, it was a, a groundbreaking work that was done that, that uh, opened that whole area. Um, we thought about and the possibility of applying microwave to peptide synthesis about 15 years ago. And most people were very skeptical because micro, because peptide chemistry was all done at room temperature. And if you elevate the temperature, the concern was you're going to get side reactions, you're going to get a polymerization. Uh, and so there, uh, most people thought that was probably not going to be a good application for microwave. But what we found is it has turned out to be one of the most important new areas for microwave to move into. And this shows you from a publication perspective. Uh, there's now almost 700 publications uh, where, micro where microwave is being cited now for peptide synthesis, and it really has changed the whole landscape for doing um, solid phase peptide synthesis. Um, and if you look at, first of all, peptides in general, peptides in the 1990s, there was a lot of activity. Uh, later in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the pharmaceutical industry really focused on small molecules and most of the drugs being developed in the early 2000s were small molecule targeted at certain proteins where they were effective where the small molecule could be effective that's all changed now because the pipeline for small molecules uh, has definitely begun to shrink and a lot of the targets that uh, that the pharmaceutical companies want to go after require larger molecules uh, the so-called biologics so there's a big move now in the drug development field 
to develop new drugs based on biologics. Uh, if you look at peptides, um, they're sort of ideal because when you're thinking about biologics, you could go all the way to proteins, but they're quite complicated. And to try to develop protein drugs uh, while it's being done is, is not so easy, where peptides uh, have sufficient molecular weight to target some of the proteins that want to be targeted. Uh, they also um, can be cell penetrating. You can do arginine-rich uh, peptides, which will very effectively cell penetrate. And generally, they're lower toxicity because your body has the enzymes uh, to uh, degrade peptides and remove peptides, so the toxicity is much lower than small molecules. But the challenge with peptides is synthesis. It's much more difficult to synthesize a peptide than it is a small molecule because you've got solid phase synthesis where you've got to go through various sequences. So what we did with the microwave was to start um, looking at the chemistry and could we use microwave and the first generation products, we were able to get to about 50 degrees to elevate the temperature to about 50 degrees from room temperature and reduce the side reactions and get, uh, get reasonable results. Uh, the second generation came along where we were able to get all the way to 90 degrees uh, and really accelerate the chemistry. And now with our latest work, we're at 105 degrees now on reaction temperatures. Uh, and that's truly amazing. I think. Ten years ago, nobody would have imagined you could do solid phase peptide synthesis at 105 degrees and get high purities and good chemistry. Uh, but that's what's been well, that's where the technology uh, has taken us. And how has that been done? We first of all had to look at the chemistry. Obviously, you can't if you take the traditional chemistry that's used, the HBTU activators and the DIE base. Uh, that's that's very active, highly activated chemistry. And if you try to run that at elevated temperatures, uh, you will get uh, side reactions, especially with the DIEA. You will get undesired side reactions, epimerization, um, uh, lact lact lactose form lactase formation. So you can get into some problems. So what we had to do was modify the chemistry to figure out how we could operate at the more higher temperatures to get faster reactions and more complete reactions. And what we wound up doing was going back to DIC chemistry, uh, which is an older activation chemistry, less aggressive than the HBTU chemistry, um, but, it, but with elevated temperature and with microwave, it turns out DIC oxima chemistry is ideal for allowing you to go to the higher temperatures. And this is an example where new technology sometimes will uh, require you to go back and look at older chemistry and bring it forth bring the two together and create something that really works well. And so this strategy, the DIC Oxima, has worked extremely well and now has allowed us to operate at 90 to 105 degrees for these coupling reactions. Uh, and it's actually uh, with no DIEA, so we can reduce or uh, pretty much eliminate any epimerization concerns and any of the side reactions with things like arginine. So it's been very, uh, it's a case where you took microwave energy, which was a very efficient way to get energy into the system, and then modify the chemistry to allow you to do things that you could never do before. Uh, and you can imagine doing chemistry at, at 105 degrees versus doing it at room temperature, the advantages, the speed, and also uh, we're able to achieve higher purities, higher crude purities now at these higher temperatures. And it's allowed us to take the cycle times now from four hours per, per cycle down to two minutes to three minutes per cycle. And when you look at an average peptide of 10 to 20 to 30 amino acids, uh, the benefit is tremendous. Uh, and, then, and then more recently, just in the last two years, uh, we've, we've even in, in, improved the chemistry further by using an excess of the DIC, um, a twofold excess of DIC drives the chemistry even further, uh, again, with the higher temperatures. And this has proven to be very efficient in the latest generation of technology where we get now purities, crude purities, 10 to 20% higher than we were getting uh, with the second generation product and, uh, and also faster reaction times. So if you look at where we are with uh, peptide synthesis now, you have systems available that, that um, microwave systems that have been used 
for doing research scale, for doing lead, lead identification, lead optimization, where you can make up to 500 milligrams of a peptide. Uh, and and this, is, this is being used now in thousands of laboratories. There's well over a thousand of these systems being used in all of the major uh, research, pharmaceutical research laboratories, as well as academia. But very excitingly, what's happened recently, uh, we've now been able to scale up microwave using a 15-liter uh, reactor, uh, using microwave energy that now allows you to apply the same chemistries that we've applied, same temperatures, uh, but make it at, at a kilogram scale. Uh, and this is, uh, this is new technology that's just become available in the last two years, and it really is creating some very exciting opportunities for the industry going forward. If you look at traditionally uh, how people make peptides, scaled up production scale of peptides, it, uh, you have basically a chemical factory. Typically people use 300 liter to 500 liter reactors. It's more like a chemistry factory. And this is, this is what you, what's been used. Uh, obviously the disadvantages, they're large, they take up a lot of space, uh, use a lot of solvent, uh, and in most cases they're slow. The, uh, the coupling times typically are, are five to ten hours to do a, to do a coupling. Uh, and the crude purities are, are not uh, what people would like. So the, the new microwave system technology uh, we believe in the future is going to replace this because with microwave, first of all, you've got a small uh, unit on a cart that can be that can be used in a traditional size fume hood. Um, the reagent deliveries are optimized, so you have low solvent usage. Uh, the cycle times are now 30 minutes compared to five or six hours, so you can make a uh, you can do a um, a sequence every or two sequences an hour with this, so you can do a a reasonable size peptide sometimes in, in less than 24 hours where with the older methods you're talking about one one cycle per day typically um, and then also a um, one of the big advantages here is you can directly scale from the small scale microwave once the chemistry is optimized it can be directly scaled to the uh, to the larger system and um, that's that's a big advantage because in many cases uh, companies now will take months to to, to optimize a chemistry for their large-scale reactors versus uh, what they currently, uh, what they did in the laboratory. And then finally, a very exciting new area is uh, uh, peptide vaccines. And this is really being pursued now uh, in, in a number of uh, different locations in the U.S., also in, in Europe, and particularly in the Netherlands. Um, and the idea here is that you uh, personalize it down to an individual patient. So if a patient's diagnosed with cancer, you would sequence that cancer um, and, and go through um, uh, a translation and identify uh, neoantigens that are going to be presented on the cell surface that relate to that cancer. Once that's been done, then you can, uh, you can, you know what peptide vaccine would be required to activate the T cells in the immune system of the patient. Um, and then what that's going to require is typically uh, 24 peptides for that individual patient. Uh, obviously, to be able to do that, you've got to have techniques or technology that can produce those in a day or in less than a day uh, if you're going to really be able to treat individual patients with that. And that's what the, this newer technology using microwave now for the first time allows you to do that. Previously, it would take a week or, or longer to produce the peptides, and that's not going to be feasible for a patient that's been identified uh, with cancer. So this, uh, this microwave technology is now being used. We have, um, we have several biotech companies now in the U.S. Uh, that are actually in clinical trials, that are actually treating patients are being treated with peptides that were produced here. We, I think there's been now up to almost 200 patients treated in initial uh, uh, clinical trials that are going on. And there will be trials, there are trials going on in Europe. And uh, it's very exciting to be a part of this because this personalized medicine using peptide vaccines, I would say is one of the most promising new areas for cancer treatment. And it's probably two or three years away, but it definitely looks like uh, it, it, could, it could really be a, an exciting uh, new approach uh, that, that really is speci specific for each individual patient. Uh, if we look at the future of um, 
microwave, first of all, peptide synthesis is already happening uh, in proteomics. Trypsin digest now is being done with microwave, and uh, that's been a successful area. New areas, we think, uh, important new areas are going to be in the oligonucleotides. If you look at DNA uh, sequencing, very similar to peptide production. It's a solid phase uh, type of chemistry. And where microwave, we believe, could be used there is to make longer sequences. The traditional uh, DNA sequencing now is done at room temperature. Uh, you can make fairly small sequence, uh, uh, sequences, but when you try to get beyond maybe 50 or so base pairs, it becomes uh, very difficult. Microwave could change all of that, and, and uh, I predict it will be explored in the next couple of years and could be a, become an important tool. Also, the oligosaccharide synthesis, very difficult synthesis. There's a lot of interest now in doing that, and it is done with, with a solid phase approach. Uh, some of that chemistry is, is subambient, it's low temperature, but there are parts of that chemistry uh, where microwave is being applied, and there's some really interesting work going on there, and, and I would predict in the next few years there'll be an automated oligosynthesizer approach that will incorporate microwave into, into part of that chemistry. If we look at the future, um, I believe microwave is still in its infancy. Uh, even though it's had great success, it's being used in laboratories around the world. I think the, uh, there's going to be many new uh, opportunities, transformational applications that will continue to emerge to really take advantage of what microwave uh, can do that, that no other technology that exists right now can do the same things. Um, and it, one of the things that you will see as, it, as the technology continues uh, is that you'll see smaller, simpler, and easier to use systems uh, that will be available for the current applications, uh, but importantly, there will be new, that will open up new opportunities and new applications going forth. Let me just finish by um, saying that I feel very fortunate to be a scientist. I, like, I love chemistry, but I also love creating ideas and seeing them come to the marketplace and, and have an impact, have an impact in the world. And not many people get to have that experience. And it's, uh, CEM started in a garage similar to that with three people. Now we're a worldwide company with uh, affecting thousands of people around the world. We're in almost um, every laboratory in the world one way or another is using CEM products. So it's been a real um, uh, satisfying to see the success uh, that the technology has had. Uh, I will say we need more transformational technologies in science, and one of the problems you have, scientists in general tend to be very conservative. They tend to be resist change in a, lot of, in a lot of places, and when new ideas come along, a lot of times there's a lot of skepticism, and that certainly has been the case with microwave. It's had to prove itself because each area we got into, there was skepticism. Did it, what, did it really work or what, what was really going on? So I think uh, I would encourage all of you and the scientific community in general, uh, you need more pioneers. You need people that are willing to try things that nobody else has tried and, and take the risk. You've got to be a risk taker. And then the innovation requires the chemistry, but also hardware and informatics. So you've got to be able to put it all together to really bring solutions to the market that will make, that will make a difference. Um, our vision continues to be, um, what gets us excited is to facilitate breakthroughs, things like personalized medicine, um, uh, important things, uh, tools that we can bring and, and that can apply to chemistry and really create breakthroughs in the chemistry market that, that, that have a big impact around the world. And finally, I'll leave you with a, with a quote that I um, uh, enjoy from Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of one of, one of the great presidents in the U.S., uh, talks about her dreams for the uh, future. And I think all of us, if we're going to do something big and something important, uh, you have to dream and you have to be thinking about something that you really want to accomplish and it's going to be important to you. And finally, I'll finish with, um, it's been my honor to be here and I want to thank all of you very much for inviting me and for your attention. Thank you.